Good morning. morning. How's everybody today? Good. Good. All right. So we are, um, my name's Rich. For those of you who don't know, don't, don't know me, um, uh, I'll be teaching today. We're, so we just finished our Christmas uh, study, and we're going to be back in Genesis today. So we've been going through the book of Genesis, um, you know, we'll basically be going through the whole Bible, start to finish, and um, we're going to pick up where we left off, the, where we last um, read, we were in Genesis uh, 24 and 25, and just to recap, uh, Abraham, the patriarch, had, had just passed away in our, in our scriptures, and, uh, you know, we're, we had just read, gone through the, the offering of Isaac, and, and then Sarah had died, and, um, and they found a bride for Isaac, Rebecca, and, and, um, and then... Um, Isaac marries Rebecca, Abraham dies, and then uh, we were actually uh, got through the first few verses of uh, chapter 25. So we're going to start here in uh, chapter 25, verse 12. And it says, Now this is the genealogy of Ishmael. Abraham's son, whom Hagar, the Egyptian, Sarah's maidservant, bore to Abraham. And these were the names of the sons of Ishmael, by their names, according to their generations. The firstborn of Ishmael, Nebajoth, then Kedar, then Adbeel, Mibsam, Mishma, Duma, Massa, Hadar, Tema, Jetur, Naphish, and Kedema. I probably butchered all those, by the way. All right? So I just realized I didn't look up the phonetic pronunciations, but uh, there we go. So these are the sons of Ishmael, and these were their names by their towns and their settlements. Twelve princes according to their nations. And I just, I just want to pause and just I, – it's just kind of an interesting thing here. You know, um, Abraham has two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. And it's just interesting to me the juxtaposition that there are 12 princes under Ishmael, just like there are the 12 tribes of Judah through the the line of Isaac. And so I just think that there's just an interesting symmetry there that that the Lord, you know, I'm not not really sure what to make of it. But, um, you know, because obviously the descendants of Ishmael become, you know, against God. They become enemies of Israel, you know, and so it's just, but it's just interesting the juxtaposition that there was 12, they call them princes of, of Ishmael and also 12 tribes through Isaac via Jacob. So, and we're going to get into some of that. So verse 17 says, these were the years of the life of Ishmael, 137 years, and he breathed his last and died and gathered to his people. They dwelt from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt, as you go toward Assyria, he died in the presence of all his brethren. Okay, so this last, this last, that last part of verse eighteen, um, you know, the statement goes like this. I mean, actually, look at the the, the translation. It says he abode against, he abode over against all his brethren. In the Hebrew word, abode over against means to fall or to fall upon. And it, it serves as a double meaning here. And so what it, first it means to live, uh, live side by side. So, um, and then the second, the second meaning is to live in a state of hostility. So the New King James, uh, again, let me just read it. He says, it says, he died in the presence of all his brethren. We're going to go through some other translations here, but, um, you know, It's just interesting that, uh, you know, it, it's actually a fulfillment. The, the fact that the other, the double meaning is to live in a state of hostility. Uh, this verse is truly a fulfillment of the prophecy of, of Genesis uh, chapter 16, verse 12, that when talking about Ishmael, it says, He shall be a wild man. His hand shall be against every man and every man against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of of all his brethren. So, so, so it was prophesied that Ishmael would dwell in the presence of his brethren. He would live by the, the descendants of Isaac, but also that he would be against every man. 
you know, and every man's hand would be against him. So if I read from the New American Standard Version, verse 18 ends with, he settled in defiance of all his relatives. So you can see that different translations are going to favor, you know, the one meaning of, hey, he just lived next to his family, like the New King James, but then the, the NASB kind of favors the, the second meaning, which is to live in a state of hostility or against his neighbor. So he settled in defiance of all his relatives. Anybody have a different translation? Okay. So now on to Isaac. So verse 19 picks up and says, this is the genealogy of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, his wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padam Aram, the sister of Laban, the Syrian. Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren and the Lord granted his plea. <coughs> And Rebekah, his wife, conceived, but the children struggled together within her. And she said, if all is melt well with me, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord. Okay, so let's break that down. So Rebekah here has trouble conceiving. It says that Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife. Now you can sense here an intense desire to have children. And Isaac stepping up and going before the Lord in prayer. Uh, this is after 20 years of marriage now. So I like the NASB version here. It says, Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren. So I think it's great to note here, Isaac going before the Lord and praying for his wife. He's praying for her, right? So I just want to ask this question about the men in this fellowship. Are you praying for your wives? Not just like, you know, Lord, bless my family. You know, I wake up every day, Lord, Lord, bless my family. Lord, bless my kids. Thank you, amen. All right? I'm asking, you know, are you praying for them? Some commentators read this like, you know, uh, after 20 years, Isaac finally prays for his wife. And I'm not sure necessarily, uh, I'm not sure I agree with that. So um, I'm not sure it took 20 years for Isaac to finally pray for his wife, for his wife to conceive. Because if you go back to the story when Isaac first met Rebecca, when she came back to meet him, so Abraham's servants went out to find a wife for Isaac. And as they were bringing her back. What, you know what it says that he was doing? It says he was out in the field meditating. All right. So I think it's just really cool that you see here, Isaac seemed to live a life of prayer, right? He seemed to, from, you know, even when his wife was being brought back to him, he, he didn't know that she was coming back on that day, or maybe he did, but he was out in the field meditating. All right. So this guy puts a high priority on spiritual health. The Lord was gracious and heard his prayer and Rebecca conceived. So men, do you put a high priority on prayer in your house? I can say that it's, you know, for a long time, it was a struggle for me. I'm like a type of person. I like to go, go, go. And it's like, you know, like it's like prayer. Like I just, you know, it's, it's hard to make time to do it, right? It's hard to make time to do it. But, um, for me, my life, personally, since the pandemic hit and I was like kind of forced to slow down, I wasn't able to travel, I wasn't able to do all the things. It's like, you know, we really started to put a, an emphasis on prayer in our house. And I just encourage all the men in, in this fellowship, you know, just ask this simple question. Are you praying with your wives? Are you praying for your house? Because in the case of Isaac, you know, Isaac is a great example, you know. He went before the Lord and the Lord answered his prayer. You know, um, something, you know, in talking about men being leaders in the house, you know, leading in prayer is very important. And, and you know, you may find yourself in a situation where maybe 
let's say your wife is not responding to you in the way that you would like her to be responding to your leadership or to your, uh, maybe she doesn't, you know, submit to you or respect you the way that you feel that she should. There's something that happens when you lead somebody in prayer. There is something that happens. I can tell you that on a few occasions, I've, I've led some coworkers in prayer, something going on in their life. You know, I had one coworker, you know, they, that, um, you know, they, they had a child that had some irregular blood work and it just wasn't getting better. And they thought that, you know, he might have leukemia or some kind of, you know, cancer. And it was like, you know, and she was just distraught. I mean, just obviously you can appreciate a mother, you know, going through the situation where her child might have cancer. And I just said, you know, hey, would you mind if I prayed for you? Like right now, can I pray for you? You know, and, and when you do that for somebody, when you lead somebody in prayer, there's something that happens to the relationship. There's something different that happens, you know, and, and, and so... And, and I've led a couple of coworker, other coworkers in prayer. Just, hey, you know, listen, man, you know, I, I know you got this going on in your life. Can I pray for you? And I can just tell you that, that those relationships, not that they were like, they weren't like great relationships before, but that, just that one prayer made a difference. And the relationship with that coworker is, is just, you know, just is different than some of the relationships I have with my other coworkers. And so, you know, just imagine if you were to do that every day with your spouse. Pray with them, all right? Lead them in prayer. It would, it would totally change the dynamic of the relationship in a good way. So I just encourage you to do it. Not all that much is recorded of Isaac's own life, but he did pray, and his prayer was answered. He did not try to figure it out for himself or resort to you know, getting a concubine like his father did, Abraham, you know, trying to help God out. He prayed and waited on the Lord. But the children, verse 22 says, but the children struggled together within her. And she said, if all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord. Okay, so obviously Rebecca here is concerned about her health. You know, the, it says the children are struggling within here. You know, so maybe there was some kind of complications happening. Maybe there was, you know, just some kind of cause for concern. And she says, hey, if everything's all right with me, why, why is this happening to me? Why am I like this? So she prayed and the Lord heard her prayer and responded. Verse 23, and says, the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. Okay, so it's interesting the word nations here is plural, and it's actually the Hebrew word goin. And what it basically, the connotation here is that this word is used when referring to both Jewish and Gentile nations. Okay, so it's just an interesting, interesting uh, uh choice of words there because there's a couple different words that could be used, but this is referring to different types of nations, both Jewish and Gentile. It also says that the older shall serve the younger. So this would have been very, very strange during this time because typically the firstborn is the one with the most prominence. Here, Rebecca gets a word from the Lord that the opposite is going to be true. Verse 24 says, so when her days were fulfilled for her to give birth, indeed, there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red. He was like a hairy garment all over. So they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out and his hand took hold of Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. Okay, so grabbing, grabbing someone's foot or heel, it's a, it's a Jewish idiom for, for being deceptive. So it's like thought that this passage, it's thought that this passage could be the root for the modern phrase, hey, you know, quit pulling my leg, all right? So what's interesting is Jacob's life, there's several instances 
of deception in his life um, that we're probably not going to get into today, um, probably going to get into next Sunday, but the deception, for example, the deception of him pretending to be Esau, right? Um, which we'll get into in, in, like I said, later chapters. But, but so there, there's a connotation here of, of, you know, perhaps, you know, uh, foreshadowing of Jacob's uh, deceiving nature. So anyway, verse 27. So the boys grew and Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field. But Jacob was a mild man dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Okay. So when I first read this, and it seems like the plain reading of the text is that his dad favors Esau, that Esau is probably a real man's man, right? He likes to hunt. He likes to, he's a man of the field. He's out doing the work, right? And it appears that Jacob, on the other hand, was a bit of a mama's boy, all right? I'm not sure if those assumptions are accurate, and um, we're going to get into that. But the, the first reason I'm not sure that the, that assumption is accurate is, first, in the context of the book of Genesis, being called a skillful hunter is not necessarily a positive connotation. So the other, the, there's another Bible character that was referred to as a skillful hunter. His name was Nimrod. All right. If you know anything about Nimrod, he was not a good character in the Bible. Uh, you know, that's, you know, like you've heard like somebody say, hey, Nimrod, you know what I mean? It's like, like you don't want to be called Nimrod, right? I mean, so it's not a positive connotation to be called a skillful hunter in the context of Genesis. Also, Jacob and Esau are spoken about in the prophet Malachi. Malachi chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. This is the prophet saying, I have loved you, says the Lord, yet you say, in what way have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, says the Lord? Yet Jacob I loved, and Esau I hated, and laid waste his mountains and his heritage for the jackals of the wilderness. So the prophet Malachi says that the Lord loved Jacob and hated Esau. So it speaks very positively of Jacob and very negatively of Esau. Uh, now, those sentiments can also uh, be driven by things that are yet to come later in Esau's life. Esau makes some very poor life choices. Also, the word that is used to describe Jacob, you know, our Bible says... Um, um, there's some Bible say wild man or quiet man. The same word for, or not wild, yeah, mild, not wild. Mild man or quiet man. The same word for mild or quiet in other verses of the Bible is translated as perfect. All right, so it carries the connotation of being upright, whole, complete, blameless. It does not mean sinless perfection, but rather somebody who walks in righteousness, somebody who walks uprightly. Okay, so let's get into some of Esau's poor choices here. Verse 29 says, Now Jacob cooked a stew, and Esau came in from the field, and he was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, Please feed me with that same red stew, for I am weary. Therefore his name was called Edom. But Jacob said, sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, look, I'm about to die. So what is this birthright to me? Then Jacob said, swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils. Then he ate and drank, arose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Okay, so Esau is clearly not an intelligent human being, okay? 
if you ask me, he's a bit of a knuckle dragger, all right? He, Jacob here is a, is a little deceptive, but, and takes advantage of his brother's hunger. So, but the, the important question at this point is, what is a birthright? Like, what is this whole thing that they're even talking about? Okay, so during this time, a birthright had physical benefits, spiritual benefits, and other types of benefits. So let's just get into the physical benefits. If you want to flip over to Deuteronomy chapter 21. Deuteronomy 21, verses 15 through 17. Okay, it says, if a man has two wives, one loved and the other unloved, and they have borne him children, both the loved and the unloved, and if the firstborn son is of her who is unloved, then it shall be on the day he bequeaths his possessions to his son that he must not bestow firstborn status on the son of the loved wife in preference to the son of the unloved the f true firstborn. But he shall acknowledge the son of the unloved wife as the firstborn by giving him a double portion of all that he has. For he is the beginning of his strength. The right of the firstborn is his. Okay? So, it seems here that during this time that the firstborn received a double portion of inheritance. All right? So, it's like, you know, they basically get twice the amount of inheritance as, as future descendants, all right? So the birthright has actual physical, you know, monetary, if you will, benefits. Birthright also has spiritual benefits. So um, this is in First Chronicles 5, verses 1 and 2. It says, First Chronicles 5, one and one, verse 1 and 2, it says, The family of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, through Reuben was Israel's firstborn after he slept with his father's concubine, a defiling act. His rights as the firstborn were passed onto the sons of Joseph's, Joseph, son of Israel. He lost his firstborn place in the family tree. And even though Judah became the strongest of his brothers, and King David eventually came from the family. The firstborn rights stayed with Joseph. It's basically what, what happened here. He, he basically um, passed on the firstborn status to, um, to his brother. So Jesus was also no, notated as a firstborn. In the book of Psalms, it says... Also, I will make him my firstborn, the highest of kings of the earth. My mercy, I will keep him forever, and my covenant shall stand firm with him. His seed also I will make to endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. So this is a prophecy of the Messiah, talking, referring to him as the firstborn. <coughs> Colossians says, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. So you have this theme littered throughout the Bible of the importance of being the, the firstborn and, and also the birthright that goes with it. It's a very big deal. Esau here is very cavalier with it. He's like, well, you know, this, he doesn't care for the monetary value. He doesn't care for the spiritual value. Because understand that, um, you know, his, his grandfather was promised the Messiah through his lineage, right? Through, through his lineage. And so... And so typically that should pass through the firstborn, right? But there's a couple cases in the Bible where it doesn't, but by and large, it's the firstborn that, that through that firstborn lineage comes the Messiah. So he doesn't care about the, the physical benefits. He doesn't care about the spiritual benefits. He gives it up for a bowl of Campbell's Chunky, all right? <laughs> That's what he does. And not only is he cavalier with it, I mean, let's, let's just be honest, okay? So 
if because some people read this and they go, well, well, geez, you know, Esau, man, he was starving, like he was like on his deathbed, right? I mean, that's what you have to believe when you read this. If you want to read it in Esau's favor, you got to believe that this guy is literally like stumbling into the house so weak that he's just going to collapse unless he eats this bowl of red lentil stew, right? But what's interesting is, is like, okay, like, let's say that was the case. You know, if Esau was this skillful hunter and Jacob was just dwelling in the tents, like, he could probably kick his butt and just take the stew, right? I mean, like, it's like, no, he, he, does, not, he does not value the birthright, okay? And so, um, and as a matter of fact, later on in Genesis, there's conflict between Jacob and Esau, and it's clear that Jacob fears Esau, Later in Genesis, Genesis chapter 32, it says, this is Jacob talking uh, about Esau. It says, deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he come back and attack me and the mother with the children. Jacob feared Esau. So there was no reason that if, if, if Esau was just this weak and weary person that he could not have just taken the stew. So that's my, that's my thought. So um, and this is a wealthy family. Abraham was wealthy. You know, um, it all, it says later that Isaac was, you know, um, you know, was able to, to reproduce and, and, you know, crops and livestock and things like that. So, um, I'm not sure that, uh, that, that, that Esau couldn't have gotten uh, food elsewhere, let's just say. So Esau shows a lack of wisdom and gives away his birthright for a bowl of red lentil stew. So imagine if your parents were millionaires and you gave your, your, your inheritance up for a bowl of, of, like I said, Campbell's Chunky, not even the good kind, like New England clam chowder. We're talking like vegetable stew, all right? So... Later in life, Esau demonstrates further lack of wisdom. Okay, so he, 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 he marries with foreign women, all right? He marries Hittite and Canaanite women, all right, which was strictly forbidden. Um, not only does he marry uh, a, a Canaanite and Hittite women, if you... Um, in verse or in chapter twenty-eight, it talks about how Esau marries um, a daughter of Ishmael. Okay, so again, Isaac and Ishmael, right? I mean, they're you're talking about one leads to the Messiah, one leads to the Jewish nation. Ishmael leads to uh, the nation of Islam and Arabs and people that are against the the uh, the Israelites. And so, but what you have here is Esau, in chapter 28, marries, the da- marries a daughter of Ishmael. So um, here's a thought. I don't, you know, the Bible talks in later about not marrying an unbeliever, right? Not being unequally yoked. Well, in this case, like, somebody who marries an unbeliever is, is um, you know, is the same person that that uh, gives up their inheritance for a bowl of vegetable soup, you know? So it's just not a wise decision. Don't do it. End of, end of soapbox. All right. Not only did he give up his inheritance to marry Canaanite, he married the daughter of Ishmael. So think about this. Esau marries the daughter of Ishmael, which now joins the two dispossessed groups of people that the Lord had not recognized as true firstborns. Okay, so let me just say that again. So Ishmael was born before Isaac, okay? So Ishmael is a true firstborn of Abraham, right? I mean, physically speaking, but it's not, the Lord does not recognize him as firstborn because it did not come between Abraham and Sarah. So, so you have Ishmael, not a true first. The Lord does not recognize him as firstborn, even though technically he was born first. And now you have Esau, who was also technically born first, but the Lord does not recognize him now as the true firstborn. You've got 
these two lineages now married and they possess or they 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 create offspring and that is the offspring that ends up leading to the edomites and you know we're talking about the arab nations and basically the nations that end up being primarily against israel here's another interesting point Through this line of people came people like Herod the Great. Remember, in the Christmas story, Herod the Great is the guy that orders the killing of all the firstborn boys of Bethlehem. Okay, and so um, it's just interesting here. You don't think about, you know, the, 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 the downstream consequences of of disobedience and in, in, in marrying outside of, of um, you know, marrying Canaanite women and Hittite women they, that was strictly forbidden, just like today, we're not to, to marry unbelievers. And so you see the downstream consequences of that. Okay, so we're on to... Chapter 26. Isaac and Abimelech. It says, Now there was a famine in the land because the first famine that was in the days of Abraham and Isaac went to... I'm sorry, there was a famine in the land besides the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, in Gerar. Then the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land which I shall tell you. Dwell in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I give all these lands and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father, and I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give to your descendants all these lands, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So Isaac dwelt in Gerar. Okay, so let's unpack this. So there's a famine in the land, right? Isaac decides to go south toward Egypt, all right? He stops in Gerar where Abimelech was. Now, uh, if you remember, there was uh, some interactions with uh, Abimelech and Abraham. Now, this is not the same Abimelech. So think about Abimelech as a title and not a person, all right? Abimelech was the title for the king of Gerar, all right? So um, sort of like Pharaoh or Caesar or something like that, okay? It says, Then Isaac sowed in the land, in that land, and reaped in the same year a hundredfold. And the Lord blessed him. The man began to prosper and continued prospering until he, came, until he became very prosperous. For he had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and a great number of servants. So the Philistines envied him. All right, so there are, there are blessings in obedience, all right? I think that's the important part of this, of this passage, all right? Now, this is not a prosperity gospel message, all right? I'm not here to tell you that if you just, you know, if you just do all the right things that the Lord's just gonna heap you know, heap things upon you and all this kind of thing. But blessings from the Lord can come in an infinite number of ways. They can, blessings can come in the form of comfort, you know, in times of distress, peace in times of loss. It can come in, uh, you know, health during a pandemic. It can come in the ways of, or, or in Isaac's case, wealth during a, pan, or during a, a famine, right? So he obeyed the words of the Lord. Now, uh, he stayed, he did that by staying where he was supposed to stay. So, so imagine you're living, in a, you're living in a land and there's a famine, right? 
And so it said that he thought about going down to Egypt. He's like, man, you know, there's, there's Egypt. There's lots of things happening down there. You know, uh, you know I'm going to go to Egypt. You know, I'm going to go where the food is, right? So, he, so he's on his way there and he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a stop in Gerar and I'm going to hang out with Abimelech a little bit. And the Lord comes to him and he says, hey, listen, man, you need to stay here. All right, you just need to stay here. And so... But he's probably thinking to himself, well, you know, there's a lot more happening down in Egypt. I'd rather go down there, you know, but he, he's obedient to the Lord and he stays, all right? So, you know, and I, I think about, when I read this, I think about our fellowship, you know, and, uh, you know, there might be some people in this fellowship, you know, and we've got a lot of college students coming to our fellowship, you know, normally, and, and, you know, I just think about, you know, maybe some of them are, thinking, man, I, I'd, I'd rather be in a bigger city or I'd rather be in, you know, uh, you know a, a more booming metropolis than Tiffin, right? I mean, so, but, but maybe, maybe the Lord has a, you know, has a plan for you here. And that could go for any one of us, right? I mean, uh, certainly, you know, at different times, probably everyone has thought about like, hey, let me go somewhere else. You know, I, I think about, you know, uh, Pastor Ben and Megan coming here from Florida. You know, I mean, I about about every year, about you know this time, January, February, they're they're starting to question their decision, right? So, you know, what am I doing here, right? But but they're obedient and they stay, and that's and that's uh, you know, in the case of Isaac, Isaac, you know, his his obedience, he had to go down and live with the Philistines. All right, those uncircumcised Philistines. He lived with them, and he said, and, and Isaac, like I said, he was on his way to Egypt, but there was, uh, due to the famine, but um, it says, so Isaac dwelt in Gerar, or Gerar, he obeyed the Lord, and the Lord honored Isaac. He honored him by, by blessing him, and allowed him to multiply, and reproduce, and become a wealthy man during a famine. Now, it says, and the men of this of the place asked about his wife, and he says, "Is verse seven now?" So he's in Gerar with Abimelech. It says, "The men of the place asked about his wife, and he says, she is my sister, for he was afraid to say she is my wife, because he thought lest the men of the place kill me for Rebecca, because she is beautiful to behold." Okay, so. Here you have Isaac doing the same thing that his father Abraham did. Remember in chapter 12, Abraham was traveling to Egypt with Sarai, his wife, and they came up with this plan and they were going to say, hey, you know, tell people that you're my sister and uh, so, you know, so, so everything will be all right with me, all right? I don't want anybody kill me to have you, all right? All I can say, guys, is it must have been an interesting time back then, you know? I mean, for them to actually, like, go through this logical thought process, like, you know, man, if I go down here with this beautiful woman, they are going to kill me. I mean, they're going to kill me for her. Like, literally, fear for their life. Now, in Abraham's case, it goes so far as Sarah actually ends up marrying Pharaoh. So they have to like, I mean, they are like really, like they are, they are sold out for this, for this plan, this act of, you know, um, uh, of, of acting like brother and sister. Now, in the case of Isaac and Abimelech, it doesn't quite get to that point. Let's read on. It says, verse eight, it says, now it came to pass when he had been there a long time, that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked through a window and saw, and there was Isaac, showing endearment to Rebekah, his wife. Then Abimelech called Isaac and said, Quite obviously, she is your wife, so how could you say she is my sister? Isaac said to him, Because I said, lest I die on account of her. And Abimelech said, What is this you have done to us? One of the people might soon have lain with your wife, and you would have brought guilt on us. So Abimelech charged all his people, saying, He who touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Okay, so Abimelech here 
shows some integrity. You know, he says, hey, you know, we don't go for that around here, all right? You know, um, he shows some level of integrity in, in honoring the sanctity of marriage. Now, also, what could be in the back of his mind? So if you recall, going back to Abraham, Isaac's father, on two separate occasions, Abraham had Sarah pretend to be his sister. The first one was with Pharaoh. The second one was with Abimelech, all right? And when that happened with Abraham, the Lord came to Abimelech in a dream. This is in chapter 20. The Lord came to Abimelech and says, hey, Sarah is Abraham's wife, not her sister, not his sister. And the Lord threatened Abimelech that if you do not restore, if you do not restore Sarah to Abraham, that not only are you going to die, Abimelech, but all your, all your people are going to die. Like all the people that are important to you, they're going to die too, okay? So you fast forward to Isaac. Isaac tells uh, his wife, hey, you're going to pretend to be my sister. Abimelech finds out. Again, this is probably a different Abimelech just due to the, the length of time that, that uh, had, had passed. But, you know, it could be that, you know, the, the two Abimelechs had talked when there was a passing and says, hey, listen, don't mess with these people. You know, the, the lineage of Abraham, you know, if they come in and say, you know, like, hey, this is my sister, you know, just keep an eye out because, you know, I had a vision from God that if we, you know, if we lay with somebody who's actually their wife, man, they, God's going to kill us all. Like, it is, he's just total wipeout, right? And so it could be that there was a real fear um, with, with, with Abimelech uh, due to the threat that was made by the Lord during Abraham's time, which was, again, not, not that long ago. I mean, um, you know, just one generation separated. So, okay, so verse 12 goes on to say, Then Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold. And the Lord blessed him. The man began to prosper and continued prospering until he became very prosperous. For he had, he had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and a great number of servants. So the Philistines envied him. Now the Philistines had stopped up all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham his father. And they had filled them with earth. And Abimelech said to Isaac, Go away from us, for you are much mightier than we. So here Abimelech starts fearing Isaac's power and prosperity and says, Go away, you're getting a little too big for us, you know, we don't want you here anymore. Now, earlier we talked about Isaac's decisions to stay in Gerar with Abimelech. And um, I remember when I first read through the passage that dealt, with, uh, that dealt with the Abimelech, I actually thought it was the same Abimelech that had interacted with Abraham. But then in reading some commentators, they you know, said probably not. So anyway, the reason I thought that it was the same Abimelech is because there's so many uh, parallels, so many kind of consistencies between the two stories between Abraham's um, Abraham's interaction with Abimelech and Isaac's interaction with the Abimelech of that time. So let, let me just outline this pattern for you. The people, the Philistines, the, the people that uh, Abimelech is, is ruling over, they recognize someone who is powerful, whether it be Abraham or Isaac. And Let's just say that some things start to happen to those, to, to those, the people that they fear, the powerful people, either Abraham's people or Isaac's people. They recognize their power. Let's just say some things start happening to their wells, okay? Just like mysteriously. Like, okay, like in both cases, the, uh, Abimelech's people, unbeknownst to Abimelech, are like messing with the wells of the people uh, of Abraham and Isaac. Then when the, so again, during this time, understand that this, 
this area, there's like a lot of desert in the area, you know, and like, I mean, I mean, if you got a well, I mean, you, I mean, first of all, you need a well, right? I mean, there's not a whole lot of, there's not a great deal of water around. And so you need wells to survive. And so let's say if you were trying to weaken this group of people over here, you know, you might do something to their well, right? If they can't drink water, then they're not going to be around for very long. And then when that doesn't work, when the, when, when the messing with the wells doesn't work, then the Abimelech of the time tries to form a pact with that powerful person and get them to swear an oath to not harm them. All right, and this happens twice. So we're going to read and compare the two passages. All right, so, and, 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 uh, and you tell me if you see any consistencies here. So flip back in your Bibles to chapter 21. We're just going to quickly read the, the, the uh, Abraham's interaction with Abimelech. Chapter 21, verses 22 through 34. And it came to pass at that time that Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, spoke to Abraham, saying, God is with you in all that you do. Now, therefore, swear to me by God that you will not deal falsely with me, with my offspring or my posterity, but that according to the kindness that I have done to you, you will do to me and to the land in which you have dwelt. And Abraham said, I will swear. Then Abraham rebuked Abimelech because of a well of water, which Abimelech's servants had seized. And Abimelech says, I do not know who had done this thing. You did not tell me, nor had I heard about it until today. So Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave it to Abimelech. And the two of them made a covenant. And Abraham sent seven ewe lambs of the flock by themselves. Then Abimelech asked Abraham, what is the meaning of these seven ewe lambs, which you have set by themselves? And he said, you shall take these seven ewe lambs from my hand that they may be witness that I have dug this well. Therefore, he called that place Beersheba, because the two of them swore an oath there. Thus, they made a covenant at Beersheba. So Abimelech rose with Phicol, the commander of his army, and they returned to the land of the Philistines. Then Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba, and there called on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God, and Abraham stayed in the land of the Philistines many days. Okay, so... Just recap. Abimelech comes to Abraham. He says, hey, listen, listen, bro. Let's make an oath. You swear that you're not going to harm me or do anything to me, right? Abimelech, or Abraham says, yep, I promise you, I'm not going to harm you or your people. But your people need to stop messing with my, well, my wells, okay? Stop it. And he says, I don't know what you're talking about. And so Abraham says, here, here, just, just so we're on the same page, here, you, I'm going to take these seven ewe lambs. These are yours, okay? Even though I already dug the well, the well's mine. Here's these seven lambs just so there's no question that this well is mine. And not only am I going to give you these seven lambs, I'm going to plant a tamarisk tree. Now, guys, think about like a tamarisk tree. I looked it up. It's like you look at a picture of a tamarisk tree, you look it up on the internet, what you're going to see is like a, a, like, a, like, a, like a barren land, like a desert or something like that. Maybe it's rocky soil, whatever. Not a lot going on as far as foliage, as far as plantation, all that. And then a tree, bam, right in the middle. So like imagine like you're walking through the desert and all of a sudden you see this tree. You'd be like, oh man, well that's, you know, it's kind of odd that that's there, right? Abraham plants this tree that says, just so we're sure that we're sure, this is my well. You people need to stop messing with my well. All right. Back to chapter 26. So there's the story of Abraham, Isaac, or Abraham and Abimelech in the well. So, so back to chapter 26, verse 17 says, Then Isaac departed from there and, pinched, and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. And Isaac dug again the wells of water which they had dug in the days of Abraham his father. For the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. He called them by the names which his father had called them. All right, let me just pause for a second. Who stops up a well? Again, this is not like a lush area, right? Like you have a well, like why stop it up? I mean, if anything, you just start drawing from it, right? But I guess, 
Again, I think it was Abraham died. Maybe they sensed some weakness or what have you. And they said, hey, we, want, we don't want these people anymore. Let's stop up this well. All right. So verse 19. Also, Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found a well of running water there. But the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen saying, the water is ours. So he called the name of the well Esek because they quarreled with them. Then they dug another well. And they quarreled over that one also. So he called its name Sitna. And he moved from there and dug another well. And they did not quarrel over it. So he called its name Rehoboth. Because he said, for now the Lord has made room for us. And we shall be fruitful in the land. Then he went up from there to Beersheba. And the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not fear for I am with you. I will bless you and multiply your descendants for my servant Abraham's sake. So he built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord and he pitched his tent there and there Isaac's servants dug a well. So you see here, <clears throat> Isaac is constantly fighting with the people, Abimelech's people over the wells. Like they dig a well and they're like, hey, you know, you, you can't dig a well there. You know, that's our space. So, all right, well, listen, I'll dig a well over here. And I assume, like, okay, like, today when you dig a well, like, they bring in this big machine and, you know, they just, I mean, a couple hours and your well is dug, right? I mean, they didn't have the big machine with the hydraulics and all that kind of stuff and gasoline back then, all right? It was like hard work to build a well back then, all right? You got to go deep. And so, you know, like... They dug the well, and then they, the people said, hey, you shouldn't have done that. It's like, well, I've been digging here for, you know, four weeks, you know, this well. Like, you know, you maybe could have came, you know, day one and told me that this was, you know, I was not kosher to build a well here. Anyway, so you see Abimelech's people constantly just pestering them about the wells. <clears throat> Verse 26, then Abimelech came to him from Gerar with Ahuzath, one of his friends, and Fecal, the commander of his army. And Isaac said to them, why have you come to me since you hate me and have sent me away from you? But they said, we have certainly seen that the Lord is with you. So we said, let there now be an oath between us, between you and us. And let us make a covenant with you that you will do no harm to us. Since we have not touched you and since we have done nothing to you but good, and have sent you away in peace, you are now the blessed of the Lord. So he made them a feast, and they ate and drank, and then they arose early in the morning and swore an oath to one another, and Isaac sent them away, and they departed from him in peace. It came to pass the same day that Isaac's servants came to him and told him about the well which they had dug and said to him, We found water. So he called it Sheba, Therefore, the name of the city is Beersheba to this day. Okay, so Abimelech's people quarreling with them over the wells, over the wells, and then not working, right? They end up digging a well, finding water, everything's good. Now Abimelech comes and says, hey, listen, man, I want to make a deal, all right? I want to make a treaty. Please don't attack us, all right? It was just interesting, that same day, that same day, one of Isaac's servants comes and says, hey, look, we, we dug a well. Imagine like, I mean, that's a pretty strong negotiation position, right? Like you got this guy coming to you and he's saying, please don't attack us. And that same day your servant comes and says, master, we found a well. And you're like, oh, we found a well, huh? All right, well, and you don't want me to attack you, right? All right, so this well, we're cool with this well, right? You know, and he's like, you know, yeah, okay, that's cool. All right, so, so they got to keep the well, all right? But you just see this pattern here with the people, uh, you know, of Abimelech, just being rascals, man. All right, a couple more notes about this passage. So after this dispute about with Isaac, he finally gets well. They were prospering, and Abimelech decides it's time to make a peace. Abimelech made a very interesting observation that they were blessed of the Lord. Notice in the previous verses, the Lord appears to Isaac and reaffirms the covenant he made with his father Abraham. The same day they made the covenant with Abimelech, they found the well. 
you know, um, I just think it's great here that the Lord just, again, reaffirms, reminds them, says, hey, just so you know, we're, we're, still on, we're still on the path. You know, we're still with the plan that I laid out with Abraham. Isaac, you know, this plan is going to continue with you. We're going to multiply you. We're going to, you know, um, you know he, he reaffirms, hey, I am the God your father, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not fear. I am with you. I will bless you. I will multiply your descendants for my, for, for my servant Abraham's sake. Isaac, I'm going to bless you. I'm still with you. You are my chosen people. He reaffirms the covenant that he made with, with, um, with Abraham, his father. And then the chapter ends, verses 34 and 35, back to Esau. It says, when Esau was 40 years old, he took as wives Judith, the daughter of Biri, the Hittite, and Basemeth, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, and they were a grief of mind to Isaac and Rebekah. Okay, so, and uh, I'm sure Pastor Ben's going to get more into it uh, when we come back next time, but Esau here, again, you know, um, when you think about why, why did the Lord in the book of Malachi in the prophet say, why did he hate Esau and love Jacob? Well, Esau here clearly does not uh, honor the Lord's commandments. He marries foreign women. He does not honor his birth, the birthright. And, um, and we're, you know, like I said, going to get more into that next time. But um, just so, isn't it wild? Just, just a wild, wild story about, um, how times, times are certainly different back then. And there's no quarreling too much over wells today but, uh, or birthrights or things like that. But, you know, so, some of these things just have real downstream consequences that we read about later in the Bible. And you just never, you, you, don't, you don't think about it when you're just reading through casually about, um, about, like I said, some of the things that happen as a result of people's obedience or disobedience to the Lord. But, but what we do does have consequences and, um, you know, some of the consequences of our sin can be dire and they can be felt, you know, not for many generations. But, um, you know, just I think if nothing else, we take away from this passage to even when it doesn't make sense, even when I don't understand. I don't understand why is the Lord telling me to stay in Girar? I, you know, there's so much more happening in Egypt. Why? Why should I be here? You know, if we wait on the Lord, if we are obedient to the Lord. He will bless us. Amen? Amen? All right, let me close this in prayer. Father God, we come to you today, Lord, and we just are a grateful and thankful people. Thankful for this, these stories, Lord, that we can learn from, that we can um, take from and learn from the, from, the, from the mistakes of others, but also the successes of others. We learned about, um, we learned about Isaac praying for his wife, Lord. What a... What a what a great testimony that is for us men to be mindful to pray for our wives, Lord. And Lord, what a, what a great testimony um, or a, a good life lesson, Lord, when we see Esau and him, not be, and him being cavalier over things, spiritual matters, Lord, and, and, um, and not, not following um, the things that, that you would have him follow and, and who he decides to marry and interact with, Lord, and just the, his life decisions, Lord. Lord, may we be mindful of these things, Lord. Maybe I pray that we would be a fellowship and a people, Lord, that would wait on you, Lord, that when we think, when we have a plan in our own mind, Lord, of what we should do or where we should go, Lord, I, I just pray that we would be a people that would wait on you and seek your face, seek your word, seek your commandments, Lord, and be obedient to those, Lord. And again, I just pray for everybody who's here and Lord, those who are not with us today, Lord, I just pray that you, that um, that you would bless us, Lord. And uh, we just thank you for this time that we had together to, to fellowship, to praise you, and to study your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.